And let's talk about why we need to burn a business plan and why there might be another thing that entrepreneurs do that isn't a business plan but is very helpful. Sure. It's called I'll thinking. Think yeah, I'm sorry. It's called thinking and planning. Yeah. But yeah. the business plan itself, you, let's, let's take out that, uh, that myth. Right. Uh, well, the title, let me just start with the title, okay? It, it came to me because I was given a lecture at Georgetown in the Graduate School of Business, and a student, after I'd given my lecture, said, well, you know, you're an investor. What part of the business plan is, is, is the one that's persuasive to you? I said, I never read business plans. Are you <laughs> writing them? They said, you know, of course they are, and I'll get to that in a second, because that's what's required in most courses. To get your grade, you have to sure. write a business plan. And, uh, and I just said, burn them. Okay, burn your business plan. It makes no sense. And you could just see the professor and the students all gasp because they've been writing business plans. But, you know, if you look at this, uh, the business plan as an idea was cooked up, I think, at Harvard about 1980, when we had students at Harvard wanting to become entrepreneurs. They were in the business school. There were no courses. And so overnight, the uh, faculty had to sort of plug together two things. Venture capital was brand new. So you had the finance faculty with a whole new uh, area of investment. And you had the strategic uh, planning faculty, the, the strategy. And you know, in any big company, when you do strategy, you write plans. So bang, there's the fusion. You write a plan about how you're going to start a business with the audience is going to be venture capitalists. So right from the beginning, the notion of why you want to do this on paper is because you want to convince an investor. Well, that's dandy, except the statistics tell us, you know, that over 90% of businesses are self-funded by the individuals. Or put this on its head and really be more dramatic. We start about 500,000 businesses every year mm -hmm. that employ somebody in their first in the first year. You know, fewer than 4,000 of those businesses have a formal venture investor. So, so it's a fraction yeah. of startups ever get to see a venture investor, yet we do this whole sort of formalized plan to get an idea in front of a venture investor. Now, one of the reasons I argue you shouldn't go through this, you have to get out there and just see it work, because as a professor myself and a person who goes and now judges business plan competitions, just uh, I do this mostly to keep my blood boiling. You know, uh, there have been times <laughs> that I have been in these competitions, so kids are out there and they tell you, you know, about a brand new idea, a brand spanking new idea that I've heard 10 times before. And there have been times when I wanted to basically jump up in an audience and say, you mean to say a professor told you this was worth wasting all this time on, right? Uh, one of my favorite, I don't think I tell it in the book, but I think it's in the book actually. You know, I must have heard eight times with such enthusiasm, you couldn't believe it, that, that the, some uh, innovator had connected an electric frying pan to a phone app so that when you crack your eggs in the morning and turn this gizmo on, your phone will beep when the eggs are finished. Right. And, 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 you know, I've seen that at least eight times. Each time students present it like nobody else in all of history thought this up. And I'm sitting in there thinking, you know, people have been cooking eggs on hot plates for like millennial, millennials, right? <laughs> Thousands of years, right? Yeah. You need this? Okay. Um, and, you know, one of the tragic things about this bill is that we have something on the order of three to 6,000 professors. And you would think guys who were really interested in this, carefully interested in this, we'd have an inventory of ideas, all right? In medicine, one of the reasons we know we're making huge progress, like in cancer, is 40 years ago, professors of medicine actually created tumor registries. So we know on certain cancers how frequent it is, what the life cycle is of a cancer, where it metastasizes, we know that because people were so curious, they kept registering. Yeah. Nobody's at all curious about how many people are cooking up another idea about how to wire up a frying pan to a cell phone app, right? And if we had a registry, some professor, let's say at Indiana University, would say to, to Mary or Joe, you know, this has been tried before. 
right? It's been tried before 37 times, it turns out, in the last year. You can try it again, but what's going to make yours more successful than the other 37 attempts, right? Well, you talk, you talk about business plans. Uh, here's a business plan. I think it was at Harvard, and there was a kid in the 60s. Uh, we may not be part of an entrepreneurship class, but there was some sort of business plan, and he had this idea that I'm going to buy 50 jumbo jets, and I'm going to replace the uh, U.S. Postal Service. Yeah. <laughs> and he got a C minus, I think, yeah. for the plan. Yeah. But he was a persistent guy. His name was Fred Smith, and he invented Federal Express. So at least there's one business plan. He, when you write it down, it yeah. sounds almost as preposterous as, uh, as, <laughs> as which, 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 which gets us to a point where we, we, we know a lot about what doesn't work, but you've also pointed out in the book the sort of things that do work. And, you know, we're both big believers that uh, lines of action, doing things are the way you really learn. And that entrepreneurship is about action, not about words. And you can only learn by doing. And so, he, as you pointed out, Kaufman pointed out, you have to start a company to learn how to start a company. Yeah. And there's no real generalization. I think about businesses as being, they're all unique. You never step in the same river twice with the business. There's snowflakes, yeah. and so that's, yeah. it's hard to bring rules. But you can learn with a specific, in a, in a specific industry, about what works and what doesn't. And I think a lot of the innovation comes out of the fact that people have been in an industry, they seeing or in a company, they see what works, what doesn't work. They try this, they try that. They either take it to their boss or they go off. And that's where the innovation comes. It comes from some very specific thing that uh, isn't being done or could be done. Right. And so it does work, and people do do it. But you also point out that if you're going to do it, your chances of being successful of creating a really significant company is better if you go to college and major in engineering rather yes. than entrepreneurship. Yes, absolutely. Because you, you've learned, first of all, professors of, entrepreneur, uh, uh, of uh, engineering their daily job is developing innovations to solve real life problems. Yes. And, you know, it's the rare professor at MIT, for example, who doesn't have a company because in the course of working on a problem in his laboratory, uh, or even on paper, he's like a civil engineer, has figured out a better way to make, to make uh, steel trusses on bridges or, you know, improve the sight lines on stadiums. Um, and a, and a company is born out of trying to solve a real problem. It's the same thing for people who are 40 have worked in a company for a long time. Look at all their advantages. They know the industry backward and forward. You know, they've seen big accounting systems in companies. I think one of the most important things is they've seen scale. Mm -hmm. Their imaginations are stretched. Okay. You know, it's one of the things about Jeff Bezos that people don't quite understand. He was a Wall Street analyst in, mm -hmm. in the means I means he's on he was on planes every day and he was watching what he what he had seen there this is an analyst is he went to companies and saw massive warehouses right now i teach in a university and if i said to any of my kids i've done this in courses before have any, have any of you really seen a big company have you seen a huge factory have you seen a huge warehouse mm -hmm. I've never seen them yeah well once you've seen one you know, your imagination in terms of what scale could be, it's one of those things like when you see something once for a nanosecond, you can't think of the world different in the same old ter terms. You know, your, your life, your brain has been changed. And that's the advantage of folks, you know, who, who are 39 or 40 or 50. They know the sales ways in the industry. They, they know what's necessary. They have a much higher certainty that the innovation they've had, how to do the same thing better or cheaper or faster or, or some new twist on mm -hmm. things that will make things all different, you know, uh, is in their head. So um, we, we need to, unfortunately, I, I, we need to wrap up because we're covering things in a way that I think we could go for hours, but we don't have hours. I want to close... You, you, you've probably, I've, I've had a lot of experience, but you've had even more in terms of assessing entrepreneurs. If somebody's 20 years old watching this, what advice would you give them? 
Oh, that's simple. Um, if you're going to get a master's degree, don't do it in business. Get it in engineering, one of the technical system. Okay. Second piece I feel absolutely certain about is take a job in a big company. Um, and take a job in a company that's moving into the future. Um, it's hard to figure out what exactly that is, but, you know, a huge logistics company, you mentioned FedEx, great place to go to work. Mm -hmm. Systems at work, you get to see scale, you get to see the uh, choreography of complexity, again, at scale. Um, and it's a great place to learn loads and loads and loads of stuff. So if you have it in your, in your, you know, makeup, someday you want to work for yourself. Someday you want to own a company. As I say in the book, there are some people who know they have to be boss. Mm -hmm. And they know even in big companies. It's the guy who sits there and watches the boss as he goes up or she goes up. They get a window on the decisions that are going on. You know, they go home and they say, you know, I would have made that decision differently. They're developing their confidence for when they get to the corner office. And the same thing goes on for entrepreneurs who've been in engineering companies and so forth and they say you know i would solve that problem differently and the way i would solve it is universal it would apply every place um and you know i want to start a company to solve this idea 